Hi students, welcome back to the chapter 15 lecture. I'm going to cover the second portion of chapter 15. This is a picture of an instrument on the research submarine Alvin that is sampling the water around a hydrothermal vent. And this hydrothermal vent is about a mile below the ocean surface. Prokaryotes that live near the vent use the emitted gases as an energy source. This environment, which is very dark, hot, and under high pressure, is among the most extreme in which life exists today. Um, so we all know that most living systems rely on the sun as their ultimate en energy source, but this is one of those exceptions. So there are living prokaryotic cells around hydrothermal vents that are too far removed from the photosynthetic zone of the ocean's topmost layer, and the only way that life can exist here is by using um, chemical energy that's coming from these hydrothermal vents. This is an interesting uh, micrograph. This is actually the head, not the head, the point of a pin. So tiny, tiny, tiny pin magnified many times, and these little yellow things are actually bacterial cells. So you can see here that this point is actually covered in bacterial cells. This is of course why it's very important to practice um, aseptic or sterile techniques in medicine and to make sure that any instruments you are using have been thoroughly sterilized. Let's talk a little bit about the structure and function of prokaryotes. This should be kind of a reminder from what I talked about earlier when I was talking about the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. But as a review, prokaryotic cells lack a membrane-enclosed nucleus, they lack other membrane-enclosed organelles, and they typically have cell walls that are exterior to their plasma membranes. Prokaryotes display an enormous range of diversity. So here we have an idealized plant cell and, and an idealized animal cell. These are both eukaryotic cells. So they are much more complex. They have true membrane-bound nuclei and they have true organelles. Prokaryotic cells, of course, are much simpler and these are a few of the common shapes that prokaryotic cells are found in. They're spherical, rod-shaped, and spiral prokaryotic cells. All prokaryotes are unicellular, but some species exist as groups of two or more cells, and they exhibit a simple division of labor among specialized cell types. Some species are actually very large and dwarf most eukaryotic cells. These are the exceptions. Um, so it's still true to say that most prokaryotic cells are smaller than most eukaryotic cells. Here we have a variety of different prokaryotic cells. An actinomycete, a cyanobacteria, which are um, famous for living in extreme environments. And here we have a giant bacterium. So this is one of those exceptions. This is a prokaryotic cell here. And as you can see, it is about the same size as this fruit fly's eye here. So that is an extremely large prokaryotic cell. About half of all prokaryotes are mobile. And many of these travel using one or more flagella. So flagella are those extensions of the cell that basically aid in movement. These, are, these structures are not unique to prokaryotes. Um, of course, sperm cells, human sperm cells, are eukaryotic, and they also have a single flagella. In many natural environments, prokaryotes attach to surfaces in a highly organized colony called a biofilm, which may consist of one or several species of prokaryotes, 
It may include protists and fungi, and it can show a division of labor and defense against invaders. They can also form on almost any type of surface, including rocks, metal, plastic, and organic material, including teeth. This is actually a picture of a biofilm on teeth. This is dental plaque. So when your dentist talks about reducing plaque and tartar, this is really what they're talking about. They're talking about a community of microorganisms that can form on the surface of your teeth if you don't brush your teeth and floss on a regular basis. Most prokaryotes can reproduce by dividing in half, by binary fission, and at very high rates if conditions are favorable. Some prokaryotes form what are known as endospores, which are thick-coated protective cells and are produced when the prokaryote is exposed to unfavorable conditions. So basically an endospore is a dormant stage of a prokaryotic cell. This is an example of what an endospore looks like. This is actually an example of an anthrax bacterial cell. The prokaryote, um, the name of it is Bacillus anthracis, which is the bacterium that produces the disease called anthrax in cattle, sheep, and humans. And the endospore is actually a second cell, which is inside the main cell. Biologists use the phrase mode of nutrition to describe how organisms obtain energy and carbon. Energy can be obtained two ways. Phototrophs obtain energy from light, they are the most common, and then chemotrophs obtain energy from environmental chemicals. So those hydrothermal vents are examples of chemotrophic ecosystems. Carbon can either be obtained from carbon dioxide or um, from at least one organic nutrient. So heterotrophs obtain carbon from um, glucose. This is a chart showing how um, different energy sources and carbon sources are used by various different um, organisms. We have um, Elodia, which is an aquatic plant that's commonly used for photosynthesis experiments in biology classrooms. These um, plants obtain their energy from light and they obtain their carbon source from carbon dioxide. So these are known as photoautotrophs. They can make their own food and they use light to gain energy. Photoheterotrophs, however, cannot make their own food. They have to obtain carbon from organic compounds, but they still use light as their energy source. For organisms that use chemicals rather than light as an energy source, we have chemoautotrophs. Um, an example of this is bacteria from a hot spring. And then chemoheterotrophs. So animals such as us are chemoheterotrophs. We cannot produce our own energy. We have to obtain that energy from chemicals and we have to obtain carbon from organic compounds rather than carbon dioxide. There are two main branches of prokaryotic evolution and they are bacteria and archaea. By comparing diverse prokaryotes at the molecular level, biologists have identified two major branches of prokaryotic evolution. Archaea are actually more closely related to eukaryotes than they are to bacteria. So life is organized into three domains. These are the most inclusive categories of life. And they are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. So all organisms whose cells are eukaryotic are classified within the domain eukarya. Some archaea are extremophiles. For example, halophiles thrive in salty environments and thermophiles inhabit very hot water. An example of thermophiles are the bacteria that produce bright colors within 
Yellowstone National Park's hot springs. And methanogens inhabit the bottoms of lakes and swamps, and they also aid digestion in cattle, deer, and other ruminants. I talked about this earlier when I showed you all a picture of pronghorn antelope and then talked about the digestive system of ruminants. So methanogens are some of those um, prokaryotes that live within the digestive tract of ruminants and they are responsible for breaking down cellulose in the plant matter that those animals eat. Here's a couple of examples of these archaea that live in extreme environments. Salt-loving archaea can tolerate very salty conditions and heat-loving archaea, again the um, archaea that live within the hot springs of Yellowstone National Park. Of course there are some um, prokaryotic cells that cause disease. If you have ever taken antibiotics, you have experienced a disease-causing bacteria within your own body. So bacteria and other organisms that cause disease are known as pathogens. Most pathogenic bacteria produce poisons, and there are two categories to these poisons. There are exotoxins and endotoxins. Exotoxins are proteins that bacterial cells secrete into their environment. And endotoxins are not cell secretions, but actually chemical components of the outer membrane of certain bacteria. So certain bacteria are actually poisonous due to their inherent structure, and other bacteria are poisonous due to toxins that they secrete. This is a photo showing um, the cells within nasal lining, so for example within your nose, and the bacterial cells, Haemophilus influenzae, are those that actually cause pneumonia. So this is an example of a bacteria that can cause disease in humans. Lyme disease is caused by bacteria that's carried by ticks, and it is treatable with antibiotics if detected early. Um, Lyme disease is kind of interesting because it's rare enough that not a lot of doctors have actually seen it, and there seems to be increasing incidence in certain states. Um, particularly on the west coast where I'm from, um, Lyme disease has quite a significant presence, and it's carried by these deer ticks. One of the most common um, clinical signs of Lyme disease is this bullseye rash. So this rash that kind of radiates out from where the tick actually bit you. And this is the bacteria that's actually within certain ticks and that is actually disease causing. It's interesting to note that this bullseye rash does not present in all cases of Lyme disease. So you can still have Lyme disease and not show this rash, so sometimes it's hard to diagnose. Unfortunately, um, bacteria can also be used as biological weapons. Some of you may remember that in October of 2001, endospores of the bacterium that causes anthrax were mailed to members of the news media and the U.S. Senate, and five people died from this attack. Another bacterium that's considered to have dangerous potential as a weapon is Clostridium botulinum, which produces the exotoxin botulinum. It blocks transmission of nerve signals that cause muscle contraction and is actually considered the most deadly poison on Earth. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pause here and I will hopefully finish up this chapter 15 lecture in the next recording.